class of 2023, I was so excited to meet you guys because by the time you're second semester seniors, you're going to be so famous. Do you know why? I'll tell you why, because Amador will be celebrating its centennial. It opened in 1923, and so by the time you guys are seniors, the whole town is going to be looking to you to find out how things have changed since this school opened. They're going to be looking to you guys for interviews. You're going to be on TV. You're going to be in newspapers. Everybody's going to want to compare you to the people who graduated in 1923. And they'll look at superficial changes, like changes in hairstyle, changes in what kids wear, uh, changes in how you entertain yourselves. But there's going to be a bigger change in your future than hairstyles and clothing and entertainment. And that's what I'm here to talk to you guys about today. We're going to talk about climate change and most importantly, how you can get involved in combating climate change right now. Before you even have a driver's license, before you're registered to vote, I want to talk to you guys about getting involved in public policy that will actually help create a safer, healthier, more green future for you and all of your friends. Now, by show of hands, how many of you are concerned about climate change? All right. Me too. Me too. But I have some good news for you guys. Actually, I have some good news and some bad news. Which would you rather hear first? The bad news? Okay, I'll tell you the bad news first. And it's not that bad. The bad news is, is that what I'm about to ask of you is inconvenient. It will not fit easily into your schedule. It will not be on demand or online. I'm going to ask you to do some things that will impact your day-to-day -day routine. But now the good news. The good news is, is that what I'm going to suggest that you get involved in is something that you don't need to be one day older. You don't need to be registered to vote. You don't need to have a driver's license or any certain educational level to do the things that I'm going to suggest you do to combat climate change. So uh, here's one thing that I want to, to recommend, and we'll see how you guys feel about this. Do you guys ever feel like you want to be a little rebellious, maybe? Be a little all the time, on the regular, on the daily? Okay. Because what I'm about to recommend is very rebellious. I'm, I'm going to say it, 50 years old. And I'm in a generation called Generation X. We're the generation right behind baby boomers. That's my parents' generation. And we were told, yeah, okay, boomer, yeah. <laughs> We've been saying that since I was your age because my parents are baby boomers. And we were told when I was your age that if you just hold on, just wait your turn, you'll eventually get to the front of the line, you'll get to be a leader. And still, at 50 years old, I look at the heads of government, business, education, media, and even nonprofits like my own, and the head of all those organizations are still in my parents' generation. And I've been sitting here looking at my watch, waiting, like looking, to, is the front of the line getting any closer? Is it my turn yet? And so I have a recommendation for you guys. Don't wait in line. Don't be polite like my generation has been. Here's my recommendation. What if instead of us all standing in a line, to wait our turn to lead. Why don't we just wrap that line around into a big circle and all get to work right now, right here today, together in multi-generational solidarity and start working today. Are you in? All right. All right, cool. So we're in this together. We're in this together. So a couple things that I want to mention to you guys is that while climate change, and I saw your hands, those of you who are concerned about it, is something that's big and huge and global in impact, the truth is what causes climate change is happening in everybody's backyard. The things that cause climate change are happening in somebody's zip code. So let's talk about the things that are happening here in Pleasanton that might be causing or contributing to climate change. 50% of our greenhouse gas emissions in the city of Pleasanton come from transportation, mostly cars. Now I want you to be thinking about some of the things that you and your family and your friends could be doing 
to address that aspect of our impact on climate change. 35% of our city's greenhouse gas emissions come from energy, mostly electricity. So think about that when you're charging your cell phone. Think about that when you gotta leave the lights on even after you leave the room. That's where a lot of our greenhouse gas emissions are coming from. About 5% of our greenhouse gas emissions come from waste. And you might have noticed that in the lunch area we have some new waste cans, the green and blue and gray. That's for a reason because all of the things that we send to a landfill that could be sent elsewhere or if we just reduce our waste, we'll cut our greenhouse gas emissions. But you know, even besides climate change, which is gonna take years to unfold, there are things that are polluting the environment right here in Pleasanton that we can do something about. So we've got greenhouse gas emissions, we've covered that. But water pollution is something we actually have to deal with here in Pleasanton. We hear a lot of high profile stories about places far away that have polluted water, but how many of you knew that there was lead in some of the faucets here at Amador? Really? Those faucets, hold up, those faucets have been shut down and mitigated, so you're good, but we had to test for that to find out. If you look at the city of Pleasanton's website, you'll find we have a chemical called PFOS in our water. It's a highly dangerous, toxic chemical in our drinking water. If you want to know more, I've got a little session at lunch on Friday here at Amador. We're going to talk about that. We have water pollution here. We have water pollution in the state of California up and down the state for a number of reasons. And there are things that we can be doing, things that we should and shouldn't flush down our toilets, things that we shouldn't wash out into the street, all that contribute to water pollution. Air pollution, we got two kinds here in Pleasanton. We've got outdoor air pollution and we've got indoor air pollution. Our outdoor air pollution comes primarily from transportation. We sit at the intersection of 580 and 680 freeways. All of those emissions coming out of the trucks and cars that are on those freeways don't just sit right over the freeway. They move out into the air around our town. We also have sometimes problems with indoor air pollution. Sometimes indoor air in the buildings, the classrooms, our homes can be up to six times more toxic to our bodies than outdoor air pollution. And that can be the result of chemicals that are used inside. That can be the result of poor ventilation. That can be the result of, of, of chemicals and, and things that are put out into the atmosphere through furniture and carpeting and cleaning supplies. So there are things that we can be doing as individuals and as a group to address those kinds of pollutants. We even have soil pollution in, right here in our city. And soil that's polluted with herbicides and pesticides and things like that can actually end up in your food. We live really close to what? The Central Valley, right? About 70% of the produce that for the entire United States and much of the world is grown just right over the hill from us in the Central Valley. When their soil is polluted, that makes it into the food of the world. So there are things that we can be doing here locally to combat both climate change impact and environmental pollution. Now let's talk about the fact that if climate change is created through local situations, guess what? It's also gonna be felt at the local level. You know, we tend to think of climate change as something that's off in another country, off in another state. But the fact is, we've already experienced some of the impacts of climate change already in California. Let's talk about sea level rise for just a minute, because this is an eye-opener. In the last 100 years, sea level rise in the Bay Area has been about eight inches. In the next 80 years, it's expected to be by scientists who've done the California Climate Assessment, check it out, climateassessment.ca.gov, it will rise between 29 and 53 inches in the Bay Area. That's a huge change. I don't know, maybe Pleasanton will be beachfront property then, but let's hope not. But the point is, in your lifetime, 
there's going to be a lot of change right here locally. And we have scientists in California who are doing all kinds of assessments on, a, on an annual basis to help us learn what's going to happen right here. And you can check that out at climateassessment.ca.gov. That's through the governor's office that they do that. It's in its fourth version now. And so that's how we know what to plan for, what scientists say will happen right here in our area. You guys, of course, all remember the California wildfires we've had all over the place. Two years ago, it was in Butte County. Last year, it was in the same region. That impacted our air quality, of course. But here's another thing that happens, and this happened a couple of years ago in Santa Barbara. They had a wildfire. All the vegetation burned right down to the ground, and a few weeks after the wildfires finally went out, it rained torrentially, to the extent that all the vegetation that would normally hold the soil in place, it was burned away, the soil practically liquefied, and there were mudslides. People's lives were lost, people's homes were lost. These are events that are expected to become more frequent during climate change. So we're gonna feel it right here at home. How many of you lived in the Bay Area between the years of 2012 and 2016? Raise your hands. Well, congratulations, you are all survivors of the worst drought in California's history in 1,200 years. That's pretty remarkable. Well, give yourselves a hand. These kinds of droughts are expected to become more and more prevalent. And with some of the water quality issues that we have, this will make getting clean drinking water more and more of a challenge here in the Bay Area. You see that picture of the nice car driving through water? That's a phenomenon called sunny day flooding. It means it's not raining but the streets just flood. That's what's happening in some cities, not just in other countries, but here in America, where because sea level is rising and because of the dry ground, they're getting daytime, sunny day flooding. So here's the good news. Let's switch gears. If climate change is something that is, that is caused by local events, and if we're going to feel climate change locally, the good news is we can work to combat climate change locally as well. But here's the, the tricky thing. It will mean that we will have to show up. Fighting climate change, being involved in reducing environmental pollution doesn't happen online, on demand, on a game video. It happens by being in the room where it happens. It happens by showing up to meetings where decisions are made. Sometimes the most effective public policy to combat environmental pollution and to combat climate change happen in local government. Don't be sad you know, and disappointed. And don't feel alone if you are disappointed that our federal government and our international governments haven't done enough to address climate change. You're right, you're not alone, but don't lose hope. Because even here in Alameda County, we have examples of public policy that started here that became national legislation. We've had public policy that started in our county that opened up the door for environmental protection policy throughout all 50 states of the US and became role models for public policy in other countries. So this is something that you can impact right now, today. So let's talk about how. You've got several government bodies that meet right here in Pleasanton. Their meetings are in the evening, so they don't interfere with school hours, and you do not have to be any older or anything else than you already are to go to these meetings and talk about things that matter to you. During every one of these meetings, city council meetings, school board meetings, water board meetings, um, all kinds of these public meetings, they have a an, an segment during their meetings called public comment. And anybody from the public can fill out a speaker card and spend three minutes telling your local officials what you'd like for them to do. The city council has so much power. They have the power to do things like create renewable energy goals for the city to do things that will impact our water quality, 
to do things that could impact our air pollution. And if you go and you speak to them, believe it or not, they really want to hear from you. This is going to be the look on their face when you show up. They love seeing students. They love seeing young people. School board, same thing. Our schools consume a lot of water, a lot of energy, and produce a lot of waste that ends up in our local landfills. That's a tremendous environmental impact that we could reduce if you ask the school board to set in motion policy and programs to do that. But here's the catch. They're going to ask you what you're going to do to help. And there's lots of ways that you and your friends can be involved in work to actually help. We have students at this school who have worked alongside the mayor, the city council, the school board, the superintendent to enact important public policy. But it took showing up over and over and over again. But they were welcomed in, they were valued, and you will be too. But I need to warn you of one thing. Be prepared to get the stink eye every once in a while. Do you guys know what I mean by the stink eye? Yeah, it looks like this, right? The stink eye happens to everybody who ruffles feathers, everybody who wants things to change. It happens to people who advocate for something besides the status quo, and the people who give you the stink eye are the ones who benefit from things staying exactly the same way that they've always been. I promise you this, Dr. Martin Luther King was not welcomed in places where people benefited from racial injustice. The feminists who were, uh, you know, warriors when I was a little kid back in the 1970s and they were doing amazing things to advance women's rights were not welcome and were not valued in places where people benefited from gender inequality. You know very well that the uh, survivors of the Parkland High School shooting are not welcome around people who benefit from lower forms of, of control over guns in this country. And you guys know very well what happened to Greta when she asked world leaders to do something people ask you to do every day, their science homework. She was told to chill, right? This is what Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Gloria Steinem and the Parkland High School shooting survivors and Greta have in common that I want you guys to summon in yourselves. And that's the courage to fight anyway. Even if people make you feel uncomfortable, even if there are people who try to dissuade you from asking for change, for demanding change, for working for change, fight anyway. It's your right, it's your future, and this is for you.